Greetings, geeks, and welcome to Wizards, the podcast guide to comics YouTube series. This is Robin's Reading Rainbow. <laughs> so we have a interesting crossover comic, and this I feel like during the age of what we were talking about in the 1990s, 93, 94, there was a lot of intercorporation crossovers. And this was one that people were really excited about. And we're talking about a Spawn and Batman crossover with, with artist Frank Miller and Todd McFarlane collaborating on this project. Adam, since you have the brainchild of this, please give us a little bit of detail on this comic. All right, so yeah, so if you've listened to episode 32 at this point, you know about this infamous cover of Wizard. It was this jam cover, Todd McFarlane doing Spawn, Frank Miller doing his Batman there. And yeah, so this was long rumored that Todd McFarlane was doing this, and then he suddenly revealed, by the way, Frank Miller's writing it, okay? So Frank Miller didn't actually draw it, but he did write the story for this uh for their portion of the crossover. But then also, obviously DC wants some of that image juice. They want a little bit of that spawn power, right? So they said, well, if you get to do a crossover with Batman, we get to also do a Batman spawn crossover on our side. So you got not one, but two, like Steven showed you there. So I think it's worth mentioning, let's start with the DC book, okay? Which is noticeably Batman and Spawn, okay? Because Batman is their marquee character, right? So this uh, idea here, it's, it starts off with a question on the back, which who is Croatoan? <laughs> no one cares. No one cares. Does that sound <laughs> exciting? Do you want that mystery solved? I don't know if you do. No. Nope. Um, but art here in this book is by Klaus Janssen, which is really interesting because he was a collaborator with Frank Miller on some infamous Batman stories, like right. the big Batman stories. He was yeah. doing. Something. Yeah. So you think you'd have a little Frank Miller style in here, you know, that like maybe Klaus is trying to channel that. Um, but uh, I don't know. Let, let's start off just with our general feelings about the art in this book, because art was so important at this time. That was what was selling a book. Well, Stephen, you had an interesting thought about the art in this comic. <laughs> I'll let you take that. What did I say in the Facebook chat? Uh, this art sucks. Uh, it is maybe more like it's like yes. He wrote. You wrote specifically. This art sucks. Period. <laughs> <laughs> it's not enticing at all. It's very uh, underwhelming, I would say. It's very it's, underwhelming for a major crossover event. Uh, this yeah, art. You might, you might get a splash page, something like this, right? Which you would come to expect from any image related right. property, you know? But then otherwise, you get. I mean, look at this Batman. He's just. Like, yeah. that's not exciting. It's, it's, yeah. It's very generic. And, but the basic story of this book is that anciently a town i guess that gotham was built on top of some like like they had this disappearance of a bunch of people and nobody knows what caused it and then croatoan was written on a you know a, on this wall and everybody's like what does it mean what does it mean you know and then now it's years later there's some businessman who died and mm -hmm. they tower that he built and it's so batman's like investigating this other criminal who was associated with that guy and so it's, it's very convoluted at the beginning as to okay there's some sort of crime happening batman is on top of he doesn't know anything about the supernatural stuff that's not even what he's involved in meanwhile you have spawn over in new york city and he's just kind of like hanging around like, yeah valley because that's what he does no reason <laughs> So oh, who, who can remember how Spawn gets to Gotham? Do you guys recall what the impetus was for that? Could you follow? There was so he had assassinated this guy when he was a hitman before he was Spawn, and now that guy's coming back to life. Yeah, well, like he resurrected. Appears, yeah, mm -hmm. and, and like he sees a newspaper from Gotham, I guess, and it says like, <laughs> "Oh, this building with this guy's name." He's like, 
I know that guy. There will be <laughs> answers there for me. And yeah. then he goes and starts having flashes, you know, his little fragmented memories. And so he goes to Gotham. And of course, he and Batman meet up and Spawn thinks that Batman is somebody sent by Malbolgia, that he's another warrior from hell that he has to battle. And then Batman's just like, huh? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. All that stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the, the thing that stands out to me the most in this is because ultimately, like, the guy's revealed to be a demon. Like, he came back to life, but he's actually, like, he was always this ancient demon. He just took yes. off the shell of this human, and he's resurrecting people out of the graveyards of Gotham, and that's his army and all this stuff. Like, there, there is one super intense moment where this like peon is next to him and he gouges his eyes out with his fingers he does like a, a deadly three stooges maneuver <laughs> <laughs> um but but what was your just take on how batman was written michael i know obviously you love batman so in this book did it feel like a batman story to you uh the whole thing didn't feel like a batman story. it feels kind of generic it falls very flat what what, what i kept saying to myself was I guess not all like super powered, you know, famous, you know, comic teams can be like Mark Wade and Alex Ross. Like you're just not going to get that kind of magic every time. And this was what it felt like to me. Like this just didn't have that magic. Like I wasn't excited to read it. I wasn't excited to even get all the way through it. And, you know, you'd think because you've got Image's biggest character and arguably the biggest comic character of all time coming together you'd have something epic and it doesn't feel epic it doesn't feel grandiose it doesn't feel like it's that big of a deal and that kind of bummed me out too yeah well what's crazy is it's written by not one but three different batman comic book writers who were writing the books at that time so you got doug mensch you got chuck dixon and you got alan grant they all had been on the batman books and what it says in the wizard interview is basically they're like yeah we have been shying away from anything supernatural this was really outside of what we wanted to do with batman but now we get to play in the world of the supernatural for once you know so obviously it did not work yeah the only thing that's interesting is so you mentioned in the beginning about how how there's this underground city underneath Gotham City. Mm -hmm. The funny thing about that is Scott Snyder kind of brings back that similar idea in his run of Batman during the New 52, where the Court of Owls come from. There's this city that Gotham was basically built on top of, and it's a similar concept. And it's, it's just interesting that they may have they pulled that idea from this comic, which I would have been interested to find out if that was the case really like at the end of this after it's all said and done like the guy he blacks out gotham he creates a pentagram around gotham in city lights so he he is in charge of the electrical grid and can do that <laughs> the tower in the middle is flaming tower but so anyway, so they they defeat him you know whatever spawn uses his hell power and everything but the craziest thing to me is the wrap-up of this book because it is so on DC's part, like putting Spawn in his place. So this is what Spawn says as Batman swings heroically off into the night. A city, invisible souls, lost in numbers. He gives, yet asks for nothing. A man who knows what his real face is and wears it with no apology. The kind of man I'll be. <laughs> so now, <laughs> now batman is spawn's role model is basically what we're being told here so yeah it was, it was just it's yeah it just doesn't ring true unfortunately and i don't think anybody remembers even that crossover i think what everybody remembers is this yes this is Agreed. the one this is the one that i had you know was able to read more of and uh it's i mean it's okay. Again, I feel like the art is a little bit underwhelming. Again, like it's got it's a little bit more colorful, I think, but it doesn't feel, I don't know, it doesn't feel that great to me. In my I opinion. guess it's, it, it matters if you're a McFarlane fan or not. It's certainly more dynamic yeah. than what Klaus Jansen was doing with DC, but at the same, in the same side, it's also very cartoony, yeah. which is Todd McFarlane style. It's very, yeah. you know, stylized. Like, I don't like the way he has Batman here with this weird kind of head. 
Yeah, yeah, I don't like it either. Yeah. His cowl was always in the shadow, so you just see the eyes. Yeah, yeah. I don't. It's I don't know. It doesn't it doesn't do it for me. Um, so you had both of these back in the day. So what do you think inspired you to buy these books? So here's the thing, and I was thinking about this at the time. To put this in historical context, this was a huge deal. Like this comic book was on the cover of both Wizard and Hero that month. They both devoted you know space to it. So I went out. And bought both of these when they came out. Probably the week that they came out, I went to Heroes World, picked them up. I read them, put them in plastic, put them in my long box, and never thought about them again. (laughs) So when I took them out, they were in like pristine condition. There was no odor to them. They were just perfect because I just read them once and hated them and then put them away. So it was, I was very underwhelmed. I was very disappointed. And I uh, I just don't get the. Yeah, I don't get yeah. this. Like, why Why this every time? Well, so you have to look at it then of how Frank Miller wrote Batman in The Dark Knight Returns, right? Mm-hmm. As mm-hmm. this like gritty, grizzled, just like, just almost psychotic individual now once he gets back into the costume and everything. You know, he's talking to himself. He's got his inner monologue. He's raising up his soldiers, you know, like he mm-hmm. says to Carrie Robin, you know, he's like, good soldier. You know, he's just like, so Frank Miller... The way he writes this is 100% like Batman is a lunatic yes, because yes. he's a person who puts on a costume and goes mm. and beats up. His first line is punks. And he mm. says punk so many times in this book. He calls Spawn a punk. He just like like everything is about calling people punks. It, it must have just, been a, it must have been a word that back then that was like a you know a buzzword people would say back then. If you, I just think it's Frank Miller. He's like, this is yeah. tough guy speak. This is this is how you live. <laughs> <laughs> tough guy. I'll say this: I hate Frank Miller. I hate the way he writes Batman. His Batman makes me hate Batman. Like this Batman is cruel. He's not a hero. He's calling like every bad guy a punk. He's calling homeless people bums. It's like, well, what are you doing there, Batman? Why? Like, who are you fighting for? Uh, it's just this aggressive, you know, kind of uh, tough guy fantasy uh, that yeah, he and, and literally, lives out. That's what it is, right? It's the two of them just showing who's the toughest and beating yes. each other to death, you know, like like literally at one point. Like. And then there's like this awful dialogue where uh, uh, Alfred's trying to get Batman to drink chamomile tea because it prevents <laughs> oh, nightmares. Funny. And Batman <laughs> says, I don't get nightmares. I give them. And then on the next page, Batman's <laughs> talking about how he's still haunted by his parents' murder in Crime Alley. So I'm like, you clearly still have nightmares, you, you freaking jerk. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? That's why he's talking tough. He's trying to cover it up, you know? I just I just hate it. I Like, Frank Miller, I'm sorry, not great. Kind of ruined Batman. Now, what's interesting about this, too, one thing I'll mention is the way it was promoted in Wizard is this story was called Red Scare. That's what they said it was right. called. It was a Spawn Batman Red Scare. It says nothing about Red Scare anywhere on the title page here. or It's anywhere. not about the Russians? No. It's, 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 I think Frank Miller may have written the script that way, but it wasn't ultimately how this book was being promoted. But you get all the Frank Miller themes, and it's very RoboCop 2. If those of you don't know, Frank mm-hmm. Miller wrote RoboCop 2. So the story of this is that there, there are these like terrorists that are building robotic bodies and they're taking homeless people and using their brains, just taking their heads and creating these little like removable head things that you could stick into a robot body and they don't know where they are and they're all confused, which is why Spawn gets involved because he is the king of the alley, right? So he's got all his homeless friends and now they're disappearing. So he's going to investigate that. But of course he just butts heads, but also it has the uh, self-improvement uh, you know, guru who is really a criminal mastermind, which was also in RoboCop 2. I think it was more of the novelization <laughs> in the comic than it was in the movie. They cut a lot of stuff out, but this a female figure who is telling you how to be a better person, Frank Miller doesn't like that. No, <laughs> that's the ultimate in villainy, you know. <laughs> uh, now, if you had to point out one good thing about this book, though, was there a moment that surprised you? Something that you thought was cool, like an idea in here that they worked with? No. <laughs> um, wow. the, no. The, the only no. moment that I kind of liked was this panel. It's a cool cape. 
Yeah. That, that, that's a cool look. It's very Spawn esque in the way the cape is moving there. That was about the coolest moment I had in the in the whole issue. I do think that I just I don't know. I I think Stephen makes a very good point about how we need to really see how they're going to reimagine Batman as not just beating up homeless people all the time and yes. beating up you know mentally ill people. It's it's. This era of Batman is not a good representation of what Batman should be today, if you ask me. I concur. And not to go back to the Adam West, though I'd love that. But (laughs) there needs to be almost like how Iron Man in the Marvel movies is kind of benevolent Mm -hmm. and tries to help people and tries to build tech for people. Uh, You know, when we were kids, we thought it would be cool to be Batman. We thought it'd be fun to be Batman. Um, Batman the Animated Series made it seem like it was fun to be Batman. Now, if I were a kid, I wouldn't want to be Batman. Like, why would I want to be Batman? He seems like the most depressed, angry human being on the planet. Well, I'd read a depressed, angry human being, and yeah. that was the definitive Batman. And that's what kicked off the grim and gritty era. And that's all the image guys were 100% inspired by Dark Knight Returns. They loved it so much. You hear them, they talk about it. Yeah. Working sure. with Frank Miller was a huge get for McFarlane. And so it's basically letting Frank Miller just indulge 100%, do everything feeding into that that yeah that maybe nowadays we are past that attitude we would like to see an evolution of the character so i think that that's very valid so yeah i mean of the two i still think just for the wackiness factor i prefer Mm -hmm. the mcfarland book for sure at least it's not boring like we Mm -hmm. said uh but yeah but it it is just it is out of control like it is it is so nuts just the machismo that is on display (laughs) and even like there's a point where batman basically gets beaten to death by one of the robots and then spawn resurrects him with his power but he's still like the whole time he's like you're punk you're nothing <laughs> it's just like trash talking this guy who's saving his life like it is so funny like the the bitterness of this batman bitter man you know yeah well, <laughs> man. <laughs> i will say of the two of them i had more of a visceral visceral reaction to this one i had no reaction to the dc one um it's just you know frank miller not to keep harping on this point he just keeps revealing himself to be not what we thought he was he's always on the side of the status quo you know he's always on the side of normalcy and and like this kind of base level society in con- like with control which like if you read dark knight returns obviously superman is the villain and he represents america and and reagan and all this kind of stuff but then every chance frank miller gets to show like oh i'm for the little guy and for the guy that's being oppressed, he does the exact opposite in, in mm-hmm. his personal life. He says the most vile, horrible things about people who are fighting for their own rights. So mm-hmm. it's like, well, whose side are you on? And again, this just like when I he's here, just like see him Batman calling homeless people bums and just like, you know, and, and people as junkies instead of drug addicts. It's like, well, you're not on the side of people who are suffering. You're on the side of the status quo yeah, guy so in I mean, charge. I think we're going to be tracking that. Like, was Frank Miller always like that in his interviews? Or is it just as he's gotten older and more free and more legendary as the years have gone on? Has he felt like he could just express himself? So that's an interesting, but this is this is a, an interesting starting place for us. Because, yeah, we didn't read Man Without Fear. So we didn't really compare that daredevil to this. That would actually be an interesting comparison. Sure. Like, like a return to your famous character. Maybe we need to do that next time around because it's been on the top 10 list so mm-hmm. much. And we talk a little bit about it. We him. have talked about it a lot. <laughs> yeah. Well, we got to bring back Robin's Reading Rainbow, clearly. <laughs> so I want to show you guys something real quick. I ordered this as an impulse order. Hmm. Okay. And it finally arrived literally today. This is called Busy Box, right? And BusyBox is a smart sign that you can link to your iPhone or mobile device or whatever. And if you're in meetings, if you're working from home, it comes with all different. I got it for this podcast because it comes with all these little inserts like recording or (laughs) do not disturb or live and on air and so on and so forth and it comes with two different colors it comes with a a black cover but it also comes with a white cover 
and it just sticks to your wall and it, it charges through like a USB cable and you can control it with your phone and change all different colors over that. So I got this so that when we're doing the podcast, we're doing the YouTube series, I wouldn't be interrupted. And then my wife saw it. She goes, Ooh, I want this too when I'm on a conference call. So you don't bother me. <laughs> Goes both ways. Yeah, Goes exactly. Both ways. But they're a really cool company. They were really, really nice. I, and I kind of wanted to promote it because it was, this was, guess how much this was? Just ballpark. 20 bucks? No, not that, not that cheap. 25, 25. <laughs> About 60. Okay. But it's you know it's Bluetooth. It's got all and it comes with all different types of inserts. Yeah, you different choices there. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool. I figured I'd just show you guys. I thought it was kind of neat. And this way, when we're recording the podcast, now I can just stick it outside, kick it on my thing, and now no one will know to come in and bother me. So that was what. <laughs> we need to well, get it's lovely. Says, uh, geek, no geek interrupt us. You well, know, I, I, I could have gotten custom ones made too that would have been like all different kinds of stuff. And I was like, ah, I just, I just wanted to get the basic kit. But it's pretty cool. I don't know. Just dig it yeah it's kind of neat so a little tip for all you fellow podcasters out there (laughs) no but everybody thank you so much for joining us for the return of robin's reading rainbow we're sorry it wasn't more positive but it is a (laughs) multi-type if you guys loved one or both of these books sound off in the comments tell us are we off base what did we miss are are you are you totally with us you know or are you a frank miller apologist or do you see that you know there's some chinks in the armor over the years it doesn't quite uh you know (laughs) stay strong and perfect through all his different incarnations uh but yeah but thank you so much for subscribing if you haven't subscribed join us we have more videos to come we always have something is it long box roulette is it Robin's reading Rainbow, covering these old comics. Are we talking about uh, our action figures with action figure fury? There's so much we will get into and we want to show you. So be here next time. And uh, hey, keep your books bagged and boarded.